no man who has taken time to holistically give himself to the word of God has not proved it that it works. The word of God cannot fail because this is the absoluteness of his power. An open invitation to a life in the word. Because you have received the faith of Christ and you have embraced the righteousness of God through faith, grace and peace and multiply. That is why we lay hands on the lame and they walk. We lay hands on the blind and they see. We lay hands on the deaf and they hear. It's powerful enough to give you the answer on its first application. Arise on the wings of revelation. Align your destiny. Transform your world. This is Fenero Make Manifest with Apostle Grace Lubega. Holy Spirit, we want to thank you for this day. For this afternoon for what you're about to do in our lives we bless you for our families we bless you for our visions we bless you for our experiences I thank you for every man and woman that has made it this day certain that you're going to bless them mightily 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 in jesus name amen greet your neighbor thank you choir greet your neighbor on the left and on the right and tell him you are welcome in the presence of your mighty god and tell them happy anniversary Tell them happy anniversary. You know, technically speaking, uh, Fanero began on August 7th, 2014. So, today is actually the 7th of August. Praise the Lord. So, the, the, that's the anniversary. Before I start, I want us to um, celebrate this setup team. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. On Wednesday night, they set up for you on Thursday. And then they sat down on Thursday to go to Kololo. On Friday, I was with them in the evening. They set up Friday morning all through the whole night. And some just went back or some sat in the cars to sleep for Saturday yesterday. And immediately when you guys were filled with the Holy Spirit, slain and going back home these same people were sitting down to set up for the service today now that is amazing that is amazing so we celebrate you people thank you very much for the commendable job and um, I also want to congratulate and thank all of you that uh, mobilized, invited people for yesterday. Up to now, we, we don't have words yet. We have not yet found words to explain what happened yesterday. So, right now, we are mobilizing for 31st. Immediately. Now, let me bless your offering. Father, I thank you for the most generous people in the world. Continue to amaze them, establish them, work through them and in their lives more than ever before. In Jesus' name, we have prayed and believed in all sense. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Now, today, um, I was instructed to take us through a conversation conversation um, concerning understanding 
what prosperity is. You see, so why did I choose uh, to use the word understanding? Because of the contention that we have today in the world concerning the same. If you have been in the gospel for quite some years, or not even in the gospel, if you have been alive for some time, you have had a conversation or anybody uh, has sort of fallen into some sort of argument between individuals or read on the internet or received a video or sat in a sermon uh, and somebody was talking about something called the prosperity gospel. Heard about it? Put up your hands if you have. Yeah. If you haven't, keep your innocence. Now, so, well, it is said uh, that it is said that there is this new gospel called the prosperity gospel and uh, a lot is said about what it means and uh, what it has done as of damage to the church of Jesus Christ. And in my years of service, I have seen three kinds of people when, as, it, as, as, as regards to those that oppose uh, the prosperity message. And their argument is one. Some believe that prosperity or being blessed in any aspect of life financially or otherwise, it's not the will of God. In fact, I read one fellow strongly saying that these people that preach the prosperity message, they are telling the church that, or people, Christians, that, you know, it's the will of God for people to be successful financially and in any other aspect of life. And that if you are able to believe, then you shall, you know, become wealthy and all that stuff. And they're saying, no, our uh, argument is that there are people who have died poor and they are righteous and there are people who have stripped of themselves everything they carried and are more righteous. So there is no righteousness in being wealthy. Uh, and some even prefer the road of being poor. So there's that argument. And then there are people, there's a kind, who are against the message of prosperity because they perhaps try to do some of the principles uh, that, the one taught to, to do, and somehow it did not work. It just didn't work. Either maybe they missed an instruction or they didn't understand how to persevere, whatever it is. For some reason, they tried everything and it didn't work and they disqualified it. It's like people who don't believe in divine healing because maybe they prayed. I found one time this wonderful fellow, he was a theologian, and he had served God for so many years and then he got this bad disease and got clots and many other ailments on his body. And then, so we meet in a meeting somewhere, somebody was showing us a property, he's somebody's property, and then this guy's, his legs are swollen and you know, he's had all these manner of sicknesses. And so this friend of mine says, hey, this guy can actually pray for you and you get healed. Do you know what this guy said? Oh no, I don't need healing, you know. Uh, I don't believe firstly that God heals, you know. I don't believe God heals. The guy said it openly. This man said he does not believe that God heals. You know, I prayed for so many years about this and I settled it in my heart. I don't believe God heals. But he believes in Jesus and he's a theologian and he has the argument that, you know, healing is for that old, old uh, preaching. It's an old thing. It happened in the days of Jesus and after that, he, you know, we are supposed to uh, sort of give our way to science to help as much as it can, and when science can't fix it, therefore we die. The problem with that man is, I think he got to the conclusion early that because it could not work or did not work with him, therefore it cannot work or it doesn't exist. He changed the doctrine of the Bible because it did not work in his personal life. Let me tell you, even if you lost somebody and you are praying for them every day, even if they die, healing still takes place.
As a generation, we have not taught on how not to give up on God. We have a generation that cannot stick through. And someone tells you, oh, I was in church for 10 years or five years and nothing changed in my life and I left it. Now I'll, I'll preach about that soon. Because we, we have a generation that doesn't know how to believe God. If it doesn't work, they have to give up tomorrow. They have to give up the next week. Somebody listening to me perhaps is just two weeks or three months away from falling off the faith because they tried this and it didn't work or they prayed and they have believed God for this and you know it has failed and then they, 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 they draw back to perdition of some sort of perdition. You see what I'm saying? So to teach people to even know how to believe God and not give up on God that sometimes even if it did not work as you expected it but you can still believe God anyway. That's another someone of its own. So some, like I said, back to the story, some gave up when they tried and it did not work as they thought it to work. Then we also have a people who saw them which abused the way of prosperity. See? And uh, when they abused it, the only way to sort of heal from that abuse some had to attack the whole doctrine as of to assume that the problem was the doctrine, not the individuals. Well, there is nothing that cannot be corrupted if it is out of truth. In fact, the way out of truth is corruption. It's just how the world works. You see what I'm saying? That very microwave that you use to cook food, you can roast the baby in it. You understand? So if a mad person puts that baby in the microwave, sorry, I'm using a very, oh, if, 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 if I don't know, pray for me. I, why, did, why did that thing come in my head? Fire, fire. So what I was saying, if somebody puts a, a baby in that microwave and, and, and they, they're burnt to toast, it doesn't mean that the microwave has a problem. You follow what I'm saying? But some people say, no, 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 take microwaves out. They can cook kids. You understand? That's preposterous. So we also have that group of people. And rightly so, because you see, you need to understand where this comes from. How do we get into the conversation of prosperity? If you're a reader of church history, from, uh, you know, the onset, the, 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 the ascension of Jesus Christ and then the disciples, you realize that their interpretation and understanding of anything called prosperity or wealth as Jesus had left was entirely leaned on, uh, on, on, on principles. They were building a life of principles. The early church was a church of principles. And then later as life evolves, 390 something AD, we see the coming of uh, Constantine, the emperor, who then brings a marriage between the church and the state and then it's clearly cemented in 590 AD at the birth of the papacy. And then the Roman Catholic Church takes over and builds a system that went ahead of the church. That's Roman Catholic. You see, originally it was a Catholic church using, I mean, meaning universal. The word Catholic means universal. But then when the interests of Rome supersede, the interests of the universality of the church, it becomes Roman Catholic. So it has to be then was a church built based on Roman ideals and attitudes. So the ideals of the nation precede the interests of the church. And then from then on, the church then is subject to the nation. You see that? So it's sub the, 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 and, and, and so you find that there is a symbiotic relationship between the church and the state in many things, especially finances and many other things. And later on, every time the churches suffer finances, they have now to run to the governments. And then eventually the churches are funded by governments as though they are government programs, which twisted the order of things. Because the church is not supposed to receive aid from the state. Do you understand what I'm saying? 
the man you are serving could make money out of the mouth of a fish. He told his disciples that when you went out, when I sent you without a bag, without a purse, without a script, shoes did you lack anything and the disciples said we did not lack anything there is a way in the kingdom to build wealth do you understand what i'm saying but because religion started to creep in unawares many people did not know how and so there was a marriage there and then even some states or nations or empires then started to have transactional relationships with the church. So in the birth of the Anglican movements and the rest of them that come through, eventually wherever the church was struggling, then the states have to come through. So you, you've, until a time, I think it should have been late, 50s, this little conversation started 70s, 60s, and really became apparent in the 70s, especially in places like the United States, where there was a mind of some of these leaders as they started to discover that the, the order was, was, was not right. They started to struggle to disconnect the church from the support of the state or the nation. And they tried by literally liberating the minds of believers to tell them, we can actually do this. We can build. We can, you know, God has blessed us. He has done this and that and that and that. And it was a good, good thing. I, I, I tell people, be very careful when you criticize everything because you might not know where it comes from. And some of you are not readers of history. You only know what happened last week. And perhaps some opinion on YouTube. Many of you don't even take time to search where this came from. Those men in the United States earlier years were well-meaning when they were trying to liberate the church from the state. And indeed, as they started to liberate the church through good teaching, the church in the United States of America became wealthy became a blessing, but also it became the curse because there were spaces in which uh, people were not established in the understanding of the responsibility that comes with blessing. You understand what I'm saying? And so where these people come through to fight what you might call the prosperity gospel, personally, I don't believe there's anything called the prosperity gospel. What I believe is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what I believe. I don't think there's such a thing as a prosperity gospel, but it's, it's, it's sort of coined to... to attack this one word called prosperity. See? And why does this one of the groups of people attack it? Because some of them started to replace God with money, mammon. Money became God. You understand? It became God. And then the birth of the newer movements of the televangelists that come through and then the money they need to sustain their television programs and build uh, bigger... Uh, bigger and bigger satellites to send the word across the world and then because they're desperate and the certain principles that are not taught eventually the manipulation started to come in you know uh, and so we had experiences people who say if you want a miracle you gotta sow a thousand a thousand dollars God tells me there's a thousand people let me explain this let me explain this there's this is the age of grace you agree? It's the age. It's an age. Grace is an age. It's not even a doctrine. It's an age. You see? Death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Receive him, him as the personal Lord and Savior. This is an age of grace. In the age of grace, we understand that our giving, you see, is entirely a prompting of the Holy Spirit. You see that? If the Holy Spirit has told you, give this so God would do this for you, that's the Holy Spirit speaking. You see, if a man of God comes and tells you, do this so that God will heal you, then there's something wrong in this order. Why? Because it begins with the Spirit at work in you, not the Spirit at work without you. You get my problem. Paul teaches in Corinthians that every man according as he has purpose in his heart, the Bible says, let him give, not grudgingly or necessity, for the Lord loves a cheerful giver. What does that mean? It means that it's very important to God to make sure that your heart is in the giving. It's inspired by the Spirit. 
You follow what I'm saying? So these guys would say all oh, this. God tells me that if you get this $1,000 seed and you send it on the lines right down there, God is going to send a miracle right now for you. You know, and then people send money and then they wait for the healing and the healing doesn't take place because there is no place in scripture where healing is bought. So we had a, a challenge of people who are selling miracles. And then we had people which conditioned uh, others that to access the grace operating on their lives, it had to be some sort of remuneration or payment. You see, I used to like working with many of them. And uh, the reason why I felt working with them, you tell a fellow, you know, I want you to come down here and preach. One time I invited a fellow. And then guys said, oh, you know, you're going to pay me this honorarium of this much and you're going to first deposit 50% of that, pay my business class ticket and pay, I mean, well, first class, I think, and then my associate has a business class ticket and then mentioned everything. And this is amazing. As true as the Lord can testify, the seed that the Lord had told me to give this minister was way more than the honorarium they were asking for. But because they asked for money, to come and preach on my altar, I sent back a message and I told them, sorry. You know why? Because when I go to America, I don't ask for an honorarium. I don't. If you want to give, you give. If you don't give, I'm good because you're not my source. God did not say that you reap where you sow. He said you reap what, not where. Otherwise then, we're going to stop preaching the gospel in people that need it because they're not able to afford. I've seen pastors selling their salmon CDs at $60. $60. So somebody cannot access $60. They cannot access life. So man of God, how much did you pay? How much did you pay to get that revelation that you're selling at $60? Oh, you know, we're trying to get some money to support the ministry. And I'm saying... That's Jesus' ministry. It's not yours. He has a way to build it. And, be, and, and I'm helping somebody here. He has a way to build it. He does not need to build it through manipulating people. You understand what I'm saying? See, it's like, even in funeral, you have noticed, and this is a truth. If, a, if somebody's heart is not made up to give, it doesn't matter how much the ministry needs the money. I would rather they keep that money. Why? Because there is no honor in God and glory in taking something from somebody as a ministry, which we are sure that it's not to their benefit. They would rather keep it and use it for whatever they think is more important than the kingdom. Because I know men of God who at any cost would get it. See, when you're given so much power, if I walk to some of you and I told you, the Lord has told me, give me a hundred thousand, you'd give it because you'd think, yeah, I'm a man of God. You see, when you abuse that power, right? Paul says, and what is my reward then? Huh? That I might preach the gospel and preach it without charge. 1 Corinthians 9, 18. That I abuse not my power in the gospel. The gift doesn't go, but you can abuse your power in the gospel. You musicians, artists. Firstly, you ask God to liberate you from the provisions of men. You get it? And he can do it. He can make you a multi-millionaire in his own way. And you can stand on the altar and even finish singing and give them. Ah. And, and then I hear this guy who says, oh, you know, if you don't give me money, I'm not going to sing. You understand? You see what I'm saying? We, we get it wrong. We get it wrong. You're taking us back to the challenges we're finding with the prosperity gospel because it puts a charge. Some people call it prosperity gospel. It puts a charge on the gift that was freely given to you by God. That's not the way of the Spirit. Somebody shout hallelujah. So back to, to, to what I was trying to tell us. So some started to manipulate people. People, you know, somebody comes and tells somebody, the Lord has told me, give me your house and then this will happen. You know, give your Lamborghini and then this will happen. And then they gave the Lamborghinis and none happened. You see? And then it, it became a very, because moment God had come through. And, and it's almost as though now, unfortunately, when you switch on many international 
you know, preachers. Now it's almost as though everything has to end in some sort of the Spirit of God telling them that 78 people right now that are watching, they have $70, each one of you, and God tells me, and then it's like, send that money right now. Do not turn to anybody. Don't listen to anybody. Just turn and, and then, you see, you see what I'm saying? <laughs> So it has been abused, and I agree. But because it has been abused, it does not take away the fact that prosperity is godly. Now, some of you, you have a problem with everybody who preaches it because some have preached it wrong or misrepresented it, but then take away the responsibility. Genesis 39. When you read the story, this man Joseph, was loved and favored by his father above his brethren. And the scriptures tell us that God, I mean, sorry, his father makes him a coat of what? Many colors. You remember the story? And then he is favored, loved by his father. And because of that, anger, hatred, envy, and jealousy comes upon the brothers because that's what favor does. See, when we pray favor over you, indirectly, we invite enemies. Have you heard what I just said? Because it is not possible to be favored by God and not be hated by somebody somewhere out there. And how do you... Yeah, somebody's being delivered. Power of the Holy Ghost! You see, how do you know the difference between favor and rejection? If you are denied by somebody greater than you, then you're rejected. If you're denied by somebody you're greater than, then you're favored. Did you get it? If you are hated by somebody greater than you, then you're rejected. Because greatness is supposed to invite you. But if you are opposed and fought by somebody you're greater than, then that's favor. So whenever you have a challenge with somebody, you're fighting, you doing what? First, assess. On this scale, where are they with me? Am I the greater one? Ha, huh. then I should know. That's envy, that's jealousy. Am I the, the, the lesser one? Maybe it's just rejection. <laughs> maybe, usually maybe. You get the difference. So with favor comes great, great, great envy. Because what God has elevated on your life, hell has recorded. You must accept it. You must grow some thick skin early and expect that not everybody will be happy at your success. And that is why I'm going to, I'm going to say this. I didn't say it in the first service. There is, a, there is wisdom there, is, there should be wisdom in how you deal with greatness, in how you deal with a seed God has planted in you to favor you. You must be wise. One of the things, the couple, but I'm going to give you one thing that is very important. When you have a God dream, be very careful who you speak it with, who you confide in, some dreams are aborted so early or frustrate the journey that should have been easier because we don't apply wisdom in who to talk to. Learn to keep certain things until they go through the incubation period and break out. Not many people should be in the circle of conversation while you're constructing. Not many people should carry the confidence of the conversations that incubate you. Be very careful. Some of you, you're so quick. Somebody calls you and they give you an offer and immediately, oh, can you believe this guy called me and he told me he's going to give me these things. Not even yet there. And then you ask yourself why everything you have shared has died. Because you don't understand how the spirit world works. Witchcraft, let me tell you, witchcraft is not just going to a witch doctor to do sorcery. 
one of the aspects, fundamental definitions of witchcraft is even the words that are negatively confessed by a man from his mouth or his heart. That's witchcraft. Did you know? Did you know? Did you know? That if you say something and somebody wishes you bad, they have already done witchcraft in the spirit realm. They're as, they're as equal as that picture of that witch you have seated in a certain heart, shaking things and demon gods flying over their head. They're the same. A man can cast with a mouth or their heart. You see what I'm saying? So be careful. Don't, don't be so, don't rush to say everything. Some of you, the, the, the opportunity comes now before you even sign the contract, you're telling everything to everybody. No, you can tell those. Maybe you're telling your spiritual authority. Maybe. Because that, that one, their responsibility is for your good. But some of you, you're so quick. And then you have a list of everything that has failed. Just yourself. But I shared with so and so. Yeah, because when you say certain things, and some sort of elevation comes. Very few men, very few men don't curse. Even these tongue speaking, spirit filled, <laughs> demon chasing, fire spitting believers. If you check their hearts, oh, I just got somebody say that, getting me a new car. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. And then they go home and they're like, that's witchcraft. You're a witch, you just don't know. <laughs> so usually some things hold them down until the bends comes. And then you bring the man around it and he hangs himself. I, I will never forget. I'll never forget a day. It was a very, very fellow minister friend I was very close to. And then one of those days, I remember I went to... Uh, to, to the US to preach the gospel. I had quite some money on my savings. And you know what? I didn't go to collect. I went to give and give and give and give and give. And then I went around preaching. I think I preached in about five states. And then as I finished, you know, they gave me a few seeds and stuff. And towards the last day, is this individual, the Lord tells me, you know, everything you have gotten here, give it to this person. So I got all my money everything. I came back with not a dollar in my pocket. So I gave it. And yet I'd spent quite a lot. And so <laughs> I reached here and guess what? God had spoken to certain people and they had bought me a very nice car. It was a Benz. Oh my God. Now again, you, you don't reap where you sow. But you reap what you sow. So I got this brand new, nice little Benz. It was a beautifully class. Very, I mean, that day, it was the Benz. So I went around it. I celebrated. I didn't ask for it. It came. And so I get this wonderful friend minister. I said, come and see what the Lord did for me. So I bring this guy to this car. And the guy looks around it like this. <laughs> With not even a fake smile, he said, oh, Congratulations. <laughs> but at least the baby was there. Now imagine if I told them somebody promised me a car. Ha, 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 ha. Witchcraft, mashaka, tila, godi, anathema, cars. <laughs> and, and, and you say, but you say, of course the scriptures say, a causeless curse shall not alight, okay? Don't worry because somebody has cast you or whatever. No, 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 it's like a wandering bird or a swallow of a flying. But you see, many of you must understand what that means. Causeless curse, all right? You don't deserve it. So you don't deserve, you're just testifying to this person. Yes. But God says you can actually cause certain things because you don't know how to speak through wisdom. Do you think that the only way Joseph would get to Egypt was through slavery? Oh, you think that if they had not sold him to the Ishmaelites, he would not get there. That's you misunderstanding the ways of God. God didn't need to take a man through slavery. To what? And I think this man, if he had used another way, eh, there was still a way God would take Joseph to Israel, to Egypt, without what? Without that persecution. Oh, but I mean, I love the guy. I give him a coat of many colors. Everybody can see. 
Eh? You're causing sibling rivalry between your children because you are showing openly that you prefer one among the five. What, what are you living with this for? You kill the kid. And some have been killed. Cain killed Abel. See? So, back to the story. The, the brothers sell him to Ishmaelites. And then one captain of Pharaoh, an Egyptian man, uh, Potiphar, buys him off the Ishmaelites, takes him in his house. Verses 2, Genesis 39. And the Lord was with Joseph. And he was, read it, he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. The Lord was with and he was, ah, 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 ah. give me some energy here. The Lord was with, and he was a, what about those people who tell us, oh no, you know, prosperity is evil, it's demonic. No, God was with the man. And because God was with the man, the man was prosperous. You see what I'm saying? And the next verse says, and his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hands. And Joseph found grace in his sight, in the sight of his master, and he served him and he made him overseer over his house and all that he had put in his hands. It is the prosperity on Joseph that pro promoted him. You see? Was God in that promotion? Yeah. Was God in that prosperity? Yeah. Does God have a problem with prosperity? No. That's a sign that God is with a man. See, I have people who say, oh no, you know, you can still have God and stay poor if you choose. Listen, if you choose, you see, if you choose, you're right. If you choose, you're right. Now, but prosperity is not just money, okay? Let, let us not be so short-sighted and belittle it only to financial provision. You see, it's a deeper thing. And that's why I'm talking about understanding it. If you study the Hebrew word here in text called to prosper, it's tzaulak. Tzaulak. Tzaulak means one, to rush. To rush. Now, it's a hard one to explain it, but I, let me take time to explain it to you. In this rushing, it's, it's the literal meaning to do or achieve faster. You get it? To do or achieve faster. In the setting, for example, in Uganda, there is a predictable way through which you are going to be successful in life. Or oh, that now you're going to go to school, check, primary, check, secondary school, check, university, check, okay? And from university, graduate, graduation, you're going to go into a certain job, a company, an institution, an NGO, whatever they will send you. And usually what happens, you're going to have the first, what they call entry level from your degree. It's called clerkship. It has its pay grade. And you're going to work yourself out. See? Or perhaps maybe go from the degree, do a master's, so your entry level is a bit fairer. Or a PhD where you get so overqualified and become a problem being hired. You see? So, masters, people do many masters. It says that they elevate their place of entry. So, when you are 20, you're probably going to graduate earlier like us. I think I graduated about 22, 23. 22, I think, around there. Some graduated 30, some 40, some 60. You could be behind schedule. But, so, if I have spent three years from 22 to 25... There's a, there's, a, a, there's a predicted law somewhere, not of God, but of natural law in the laws of men where I ought to be. You cannot expect a 25-year-old who has graduated working an 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. job, uh, earning 1 million shillings or probably 2 and then becomes 3, promoted every year. If you're a hard worker, perhaps you enter supervisory after 2 years or 3. You're not expected to drive a 500 million shillings car and a $100,000 car. You're not expected to drive it, you see? Because you are predicted on how you should move. Unfortunately, many Christians move under that law. 
it is hidden, it's insidious, it is dangerous, and it is of the fallen world. You see what I'm saying? And scientists have explained everything, but they failed to explain something called naive meritocracy. It's a conversation that began mostly uh, in the parts of Asia, uh, especially in China, and then it started coming through. The Europeans are understanding it. The Americans have understood it. Uh, that they are trying to find a scientific explanation of why certain people are successful, yet they don't have the merit of that success. See, some of you went to school. When you saw these guys who were first in class, you assumed that because this guy is a clever guy in class, he's going to make it in life. Alas, he has have evolved. You remember that guy who was always first in class? And then one day you find the guy on the streets and he's putting on very old sandals and he's dirty and filthy. And the guy you admired is now the guy who admires you. Yet you struggled. You always, you know, passed with bare minimum, 50%. Oh! You, you, you were always a survivor school through school. The, the cutoff point was 49. You got a 50. You see? So, well, there was, there was this mind that the world was supposed to reward merit. And I'm not against merit. I'm not saying don't study. Study hard for the world who are good performers in school, if I show you my transcript, you'd, you'd know why I'm your pastor. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> but that was not the guarantee of success. It's not the guarantee of prosperity. As for the realm of ministering to the world, and it's so required. It's so required. It's very important. I cannot emphasize it. But also we must understand that now the world is appreciating what the Bible knew all along. You see? Have you ever met those guys? Some of you, I think, who have been in the business world and understand this. You find a guy who... Why is he rich? He doesn't even know how to talk. He's slow in every aspect. I'm going to give you your money. You don't worry. I, you know? And the guy has wealth. Then you find those articulate guys who just know how the market works. They know how to cross T's and dot I's balance sheets and projections. They, they understand the accounts of things. They know economies and the latest investments. That I'm a pa, pa, pa. And the guys are broke. <laughs> help me, help me. Do I have a witness who has seen something like that? Somebody looks so damn to have wealth. And then you have those people who don't look like they deserve it. They even waste it, but they're still getting richer. Ha. Ah. Why? The race is not to the swift, neither battle to the strong. Yet bread to men which are wise, or riches to men of understanding. No favor to men of skill, but time and chance happens to them all. We have got a higher law than merit. It's called time and chance. The Hebrew translation experiences with the power of opportunity. That's how you translate time and chance. Experiences with the power of opportunity. Because you might think Isen Bolt is the fastest man in the world. Oh no, he was the fastest man given opportunity to run. There were, there were, there were circumstances that favored him. Are you getting it? There were circumstances that favored him. He had the right coach. There was a truck to run on. Probably when he was in school, one of those days when they looked for people to run, he was a tall guy with long legs, and he said, you know, let's get this guy running. So there are many things that perhaps you might find the fastest man in the world is in a village in Rochere right now, this very second, chasing a young one of a cow. He's running with one eye closed. And people in the village know that if you fail to catch a cow, just call Bright. <laughs> Not real names. Pseudo. Not Pastor Rohi Bright. 
not in the example. Are you following what I'm saying? But there's a realm in which that young man was not invited to attract the star to brighten him to the place of training, blessing, positioning, and opportunity. Perhaps the best footballer in the world has never touched a ball. The would have been best footballer in the world has never played football because circumstances never favored him. That's an altered world. That's a sign of an altered world. And many Christians live in that realm, by the way. And they'll struggle through life because they've never found themselves. That definition is not quite clear with them because it only takes God. It only takes God. So many people live in that world where only merit can achieve. But God has given us a world where that doesn't work. A world higher than that. As I'm choose a lower one. You know, that's a conversation I pray one day. I really dig so deep to help us understand time and chance. Time and chance. Experience is an opportunity. Because I've seen the greatest in the world sit down with them for just a few minutes. Anybody who has walked a certain place, I studied this, believe me, for more than 10 years. When they speak, they can speak a million things and right there as they are speaking, it comes and you're like, ah, this is why. And if you're a very ardent contemplator, you can pick it. The seed is always there of experience. The opportunities usually follow experience. Let me tell you, many of these worlds are, are usually ready when you are ready. Never forget that. They're usually ready when you're ready. You might not be ready physically. You might not be ready mentally. But there's some sort of readiness spiritually. You might not even know it. But there's some sort of readiness spiritually. And it takes wisdom to understand what I'm saying. Somebody shout hallelujah. So, but to break that horse and disrupt that order and do in two or three years what this natural law of fallen men would not predict. That is rushing. That's what it's talking about here. Did you get it? That's rushing. But it also means advancement. Saulak means advancement. Prosperity is advancement. It means to make progress. It means to be profitable. So it's not only monetarily. You can progress in your marriage. That's prosperous. You can advance in your education. You might probably not have money, but you're a great student in class. That's prosperity. You see what I'm saying? So it's not just monetarily. It's, yes, monetary, yes, but many other aspects as well. And we have people who are successful in one area, but not successful in another one. You see? But it's the will of God that you are successful in everything. It also means success. Why I prefer the Hebrew is because when you go to the Greek in 3 John chapter 1, verses 2, beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. When you greet the Greek word there, prosper, is you or do, but it only means successful. So it's right, it agrees with the Hebrew, but it only has one aspect of success. And some successes might not necessarily be advancement. You see, so it's not wrong, it's just not as complete as the sacred language of Hebrew. You see, so when you go back to the Hebrew, it speaks of advancement. That the Lord was with Joseph and he advanced. The Lord was with Joseph and he progressed. The Lord was with Joseph and he profited. Profited. It's the power of profit. It's the power to advance. Because God is not a static God. Nothing he has created was meant to be static. Even the earth that you're seated in, you feel you're seated still on one chair. But believe me, it's moving. The earth is moving. Nothing is static. Even his power. The Bible says it's dynamic in nature. Read it. James 5.16. That the earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer 
over righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. The way of God is supposed to be dynamic. You are not meant to just stay there. Even your body cannot allow. You go to sleep tomorrow morning and your beard is grown. Because nothing was meant to be static. Your nails have grown. Nothing was meant to be static. Your skin is growing. Nothing was meant to be static. It's just the world we live in. Things are supposed to evolve. Seasons are changing. Days are changing. Summer, heat, winter, cold. Everything is changing. Time is evolving. You enter this room at about 11. Some, it's coming to 1 p.m. You're here. Some, something is changing. The world was never meant to be static. How can you be stuck in a moving world? You understand what I'm saying? How can you be stuck in a moving world? How can you be there and there's nothing adding on you? The Bible says, blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits. Every morning you wake up, God has created this world to respond to you with some load of benefit. And what's the end of that? To lighten your way. Oh, what if it's hard? You know, you prosperity guys, you tell people that things are going to be easy. What if you go through what's hard? Yeah, you go through it and come out of it and still go to that place. If you read the Amplified Version, read the Amplified Version of that psalm. It says, blessed be the Lord. Now I want you to read it. Who bears our burdens and carries us day by day, even the God who is our salvation. I say, seller, pause, calmly think of that. Because you might read that portion of scripture and just skip it and go to the next. But God has said, pause, seller, calmly think about this thing. Don't rush, first contemplate. This is the contemplation. Every day, if this is your burden, right? Blessed be the God who bears, sorry, he doesn't throw it down. Who bears your burden? Are you following? He bears your burden. So that means you, you are light. And then after bearing your burden, he carries you. Did you get it? There's a difference between you have a burden and then he carries you with your burden. You're seated, but your neck is what? Yeah, squashing. No. He carries your burden and then he carries you every day. See, I wish you understand what that experience means. If many people understood it, they would live a very, 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 very effortless life. But like one man sang, Oh, what peace we often Forfeit Oh What needless Pain we bear You can end there so This man is saying Some people carry They bear pain They are not supposed to bear They carry Trouble they are not supposed to trouble To carry They carry contentions They are not supposed to carry. They carry weights and challenges and sicknesses and they carry, you're carrying things you're not supposed to carry. Have you realized that Isaiah he uses the language he himself what? Bore. He took, he carried our sicknesses. He took it away from you so he would carry that. Are you following what I'm saying? It's very possible to live an effortless life. Yes. It's very possible for life to be so kind to you. That where terror is, you're not. Where violence is, you're not. Where hatred is, you're not. It's possible. He daily, he, every morning, he intends it to be like that. But you choose an inferior life. Because of some doctrine somebody told you and they cannot justify through scripture. This is a word. He carries you. Every day God is supposed... So the KJV then says, He loadeth us. That's how he loads you, by lightening you up. Oh. God loads you up by tight... Yes, by making life more convenient for you. So you will serve God easily. The Lord was with Joseph. If you go down in 39, 23, 
even when he goes in the prisons, after Potiphar had put this uh, case on him uh, uh, against him, sorry, for what his wife had accused him of, the keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with who? Joseph, because he had put him in charge of the prisoners. And that which he, Joseph, did, the Lord made it to prosper. God made it to prosper, to advance, to progress, to profit. So if you're building a ministry, it must prosper. If you're building a business, it must advance. If you're building a marriage, it must advance. If you're raising children, there must be some advancement. If you're in your career, it has to advance. Everything about you must advance. Somebody say, Amen. Amen. Let's go to this young man called Uzziah. This guy's father, Amaziah, passed. And Uzziah, the king, was 16 years old. And then he got onto this throne early as a young man. And the scriptures tell, tell, the scriptures tell us that from the time he ascends to that throne, verses 5, 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verses 5, this Uzziah boy, the Bible says, sought God in the days of who? Zechariah, who Zechariah had understanding of the visions of God. And so he stayed a uh, prophet in the life of this young man. And the Bible says, and as long as Uzziah sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. As long as, see, as long as, as long as, as long as you are a seeker of God, you must advance. You must advance. You must advance. It's a hard one to have in Africa, especially for what you people, we go through. You see? Because we know how many girls are selling their bodies on the streets because of poverty. Poverty is bad. It's bad. Let me tell you, there is nothing as frustrating in the world that is moving, I said, for you to be stuck. Even if it's that little small thing that I'm tired of this, but I cannot buy a new one, there's something wrong with you spiritually. It's not right. Because according to God, you don't need money to buy. Again, there's another law that undergirds how we buy. But again, because you are in the world of fallen men, you are talking about money. Now, I wish I could even take in that conversation. Because if I had the chance to, I would make some of you realize money is nothing. It's an idea. It's an idea. Nations trade against assets. You know that. It's a translation of the assets that then define the treasure of that nation and consequently the wealth of that nation and they seek a language to give to men to understand the wealth of that nation and that's the principle underlying on how much or why a nation should print money. It's against some other transaction that equates to the wealth and so the assets of that nation which are then physical like land, minerals, etc. It's common sense. You don't just wake up because you're a nation and then you just print money. No, somebody out there, there's a law that holds that nation against how much it has. That is why when it needs money more than the assets that it has, then it has to borrow. That's why nations borrow. Against those which are richer. So money is just the language you and I understand, but heaven doesn't understand money that way. It understands the concept of money, but it doesn't understand it the way you understand it. Because if money answers all things, and in Isaiah he says, come without money and buy, then there has to be some sort of transaction in the kingdom that overrides how the men of this world transact. If you have not understood that, you will be a survivor in the world of men. I'm telling you that because I'm a free man here. And there are things I've seen that surely could not have come a certain way. I just want to give examples. Because 
you'll ask more questions. And I don't have time to answer them. But what I'm telling you is true. It's just that I, I have to exercise some restraint in explaining some of these things because I don't know who and where you are when I'm explaining this. Not many of you are able to understand or conceive what I'm saying because people look at money as a god. It's, it's, thing, it's just paper. Think about it. How much do you need to make that paper? What makes it expensive? You just need to add zeros. You just get paper and add zeros, and that's the truth. You just type more zeros. And then nations buy it. They buy that paper at a certain price. And some people who are bankers can tell you, some monies, physical men, are made more expensively. They are made more expensively than the very value written on those papers. So what is money? Who commands the power to buy? You see what I'm saying? If money answers, who questions? Who commands for money to answer? And where do you live? You see what I'm saying? Because somebody must be able to, uh, there's that saying, it's English. I'm trying to remember it. There's, there's that saying, he that controls the what? The piper, something like that. Whatever's the tune. Who, who rem Remind me, you English people, this is an African man. <laughs> English is not my first language. Help me. He that controls the, he that plays the piper, holds the what? Holds the tune. Thank you. See, I've learned something too. He that, that, that pl plays the what? The pipe. Controls the tune. Exactly. This thing is at an answering place. It's at a tune place. Money answering is a tune. It's, a it's at the, the, the side of the tune. Who is helping? Who is piping? Who is blowing the trumpet? Paul said it. Huh? He said that except they give a distinction in sound. Huh? That's what Paul said. Whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds. How shall it be known? What is piped? But who is blowing it? That's why you should leave. Because if you do, then money answers you. Did you get it? If you do, money then answers you. Okay. Let me just continue for purposes of not being understood by many people. Now, back to what I was trying to tell us. As long as this man sought God, the Bible says God made him to prosper. So as a consequence of a constant seeker, his advancement, as long as so it's not a one-day thing where you say, you know, I went on the mountain and I asked God for this, and after asking God for this, he did it, and that was it. No, it's a constant pursuit. When you read uh, Joshua 1.8, this book of the law shall not depart from your what? From your mouth. He says, thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Did he say once in a month? Did he say once in a year? Did he say once in two weeks? Did he say today you do it and then tomorrow you, you know, just rest out? He said day and night that thou mayst observe, observe to do according as is what is written in the law. He says for thou shalt make your way prosperous and have good success. Again, prosperity has come. That a man cannot think of the word and meditate it every day. Speak it over their lives every day. And the Bible says, and that man will not observe to do. The doing comes as well, because it's important. You know, we have these people who misunderstand grace for being this a pass passive, you know, abandonment, that laxity and laziness that is really demonic. And they think that they're just going to sit back and everything will work out itself. The meditation, the speaking of the word, is to allow it to work through you, to observe, to do. Eventually, the work comes. But the difference between grace and law is we believe, and then the the works follow the faith, the law, it's the 
works that justify, no, when you are a grace preacher, when we are preaching grace, we say believe first and then allow that faith to operate through you to work. The man of the law first works to attain the faith. That's the difference. It's the only difference. We're all going for the same thing, but we have switched order. The Bible is very clear on how the order should be. When you read James, the Bible says, faith without works is what? Dead. But which comes first? Which comes first? Faith. See? Works don't come before faith. Now, let me finish because of time. As long as, when I read things uh, such as as long as, when I read things such as Joseph earned a place with Potiphar, enough for Potiphar to see this boy and require to put him above all his servants, there must have been some sort of operation, working of God in the life of this young man by the spirit of prosperity that makes his labors exceptional. It's not something we just speak over you and you expect it to happen because it was spoken, you must understand that there's some mechanics, there's something that has to run this engine. And that is why in this definition, I see, if you begin from Uzziah's story, I see that prosperity has a, comes with a resilience of spirit. As long as it comes with a mastery of your soul to align it to certain principles spiritually, a crucifixion or a deadening, deadening of your flesh. The flesh must be crucified. The soul must be mastered. The spirit must be resilient. You learn to be a fighter. You become a warrior in your spirit. It's a wonderful conversation, especially for the younger generation. These young folk don't like working. They don't like working. They don't like anything that breaks them. They, they think that they're just going to sit in an ant like a, a queen ant and wait for their colonies to come carrying food around them because they're under grace. And you know what happens? They become lazy. See, many, many, many young people don't like working. They don't understand. And you cannot say that I'm an advancing person without the principles that underline that advancement, that underline that, that advancement. It's a very important thing for you not to forget that. That's what Hosea teaches us. As long as whatever you choose to do, do it with this resilience. Do it with this heart. You see what I'm saying? Give it your best. Put your all in it. Yourself in it. The Greek word is meraki. But whatever you do will carry a blueprint of the spirit of diligence operating on your life as an individual. Because see, that's the realm in which we truly possess things. When you talk about possessing your possessions, it's not, I possess, I possess. No, it's yourself in a thing. That when they see it, they can see you in it. Why do you think that when Jesus raised the church, when they were turned to you, they were called Christian? Why wouldn't Christ be isolated from what was happening with his individuals? Because his self was shed in the work. You understand what I'm saying? You're, you're dealing with a generation of folk who want to start a business and they never step there. Even the guy operating a mobile money shop, he leaves somebody in Luganda. And then you're going to do what? He wants to stay home and watch pirated movies. They buy them from some video libraries. You understand what I'm saying? You're waking up at midday. You go to bed at 10 p.m. or 9 p.m. and you wake up at midday. Then you say, I'm the righteousness of God. And you're right. <laughs> you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That means you have not understood the responsibility that comes with God's creation in your life. You're following what I'm saying? The spirit of diligence and excellence and commitment has to follow anybody who believes in the prosperity God gives. Joseph was not a success 
because when the rest of the servants were working, he was speaking in tongues. And that's a common sense I'm trying to bring back in church. Yes, you don't need to clap, but that's a common sense I'm trying to bring back in the church because certain things don't exist in the realm of prayer. They exist in the principles that God has given us to apply ourselves. You find these Christians praying the whole night, rokokoko, rokokokoko, money, money fall, eh, miracle money. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, God can actually do a miracle money. But you, you read the people in scripture who got miracle money. They were prosperous men. Do you understand what I'm saying? You find these guys who pray so much every time in the overnight, their church, and the more they look broke, get a job, you'll still stay righteous. Yeah, come to church and pray, and after praying, go in the world and fight your way out and define your mark. Find the guy is 22. He's, he's just hanging around the church, even when it's not service day. Yeah, you saw those boys. They come and just sit at the office the whole day while the world is moving on. He just sit at their city. They don't know me, me, I'm working. Do you understand what I'm saying? No. Some of us have to get serious. That's why I'm opposed to churches. I want people to pray every day. You want people to pray every night. When are they going to work? Come on, let's think. Let's think. Let them make you more righteous. Yeah, because a man can stay in a factory, you know, working on bus stop while he's speaking in tongues. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Yes. Teach them a personal life of prayer and send them working while they're making biscuits they're speaking in tongues while they're in the computer trying to catch up making reports i mean i, I used to come from kcb working an 8 p.m to 6 or 7 p.m job and i was effective fanero grew to 2,000 members when i was still a banker and effective at my workplace i wake up in the morning sit on the computer reply my emails send the reports you know, build correspondences, but I'm speaking in tongues. And then I come off that building at 6 p.m. or 7, and then I go in a meeting and make a lemon walk. I remember one time I was from the bank, very tired, and they brought a girl with leukemia, stage four, terminal. And I said, receive healing. And cancer left her. And then you hear guys saying full time. God has called me to full time. What do you mean by full time? Up to today, I still do businesses because I don't want my wife to rely on your, book, your, your baskets. Do you understand what I'm saying? But I'm preaching the gospel and yet I'm working every day. Some of you, you don't even have a job, but you're tired. Fire, 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 fire. A hundred times, fire, fire. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout glory to God. The second thing about this, you should look at prosperity as the power to ov ov overcome or uh, the, the obstructions, the heaters, the challenges, the obstacles on your journey to fulfilling divine purpose. That's how you should look at it. Look at prosperity as the power to overcome the obstacles, the challenges, the heaters on your journey to fulfill the purposes of God. Because the end of this is not having a good car, having a beautiful wife, driving, you know, living in a good house in a mansion somewhere on a hill. The end of this is God's purpose on your life. So look at prosperity as the power that advances you past the obstacles that stand in your way in fulfilling the dream of God on your life. Why? Joseph was not being prosperous in the house of Potiphar or in that prison just to be a prosperous guy. There was a purpose to that. God was building the preserver of the posterity of Israel. He was building the wisdom to define food in the time where Egypt would have famine. Not only Egypt, because when the famine came, it hit the whole world. There was not just a man walking in the prison cells or in Potiphar's house. Something in there was brewing for purpose and he was, you know, building something bigger than him. 
And somebody will say, oh, but you know, as long as they saw Lord, the Lord, they were prosperous. Me, I'm seeking God. I don't see prosperity. And I know folk who don't pray that much, but they're prosperous. And I want to tell you, there's a difference between you being prosperous in the way of God and being prosperous in the way of the world, because anybody can be prosperous, even if they don't know God. They can rob money tomorrow and break through a bank and tomorrow they are a million dollars rich. They can hit a jackpot, which is also not godly. Gambling is not spiritual. But I still hear, you know, uh, Christians buying lottery tickets. Do you think if you bought a lottery ticket and won $100 million, do you really think that the power that comes with that money comes with no demand? And that demand might be bigger than your life personal is able to pay. Don't ever be caught up in silly things like lottery. I stood on the pulpit years ago and I prophesied about D, D9. You remember that, that year? I warned and I said people were investing in D9. That year I even warned about cryptocurrency. And that year crypto hit bottom. And then D9 crashed and many Christians listening to me now lost money. How can somebody tell you that you're going to give this money so you get this money? It's supposed to be a trade of good service against money. But how can you say, if you put this one, you'll get... Let me tell you, it might take five years, it might take six years, it might take seven years, but anything that translates against money one day will crash with everything you bought with it. Mark my words. Because money never multiplies money without trading with the earth. God has not set the economy of the world to work that way. It never multiplies with money without touching the earth. If it does, that's gambling and it's short-lived. You can gamble 10 years, but the day you least expect it is the day it comes biting. And it usually takes everything. I'm speaking Bible here. I'm not speaking conventional wisdom. Seed and harvest. That's what he has set in the earth. Don't be deceived. Seed, time, and harvest. Touches the earth. As long as the earth remaineth. How can somebody tell you, give you 100, if in this program, when you give 100 million, you get double. So the one who is doubling it for me, what is he doing to double it? Are you following what I'm saying? And then somebody, say, somebody just buys, just like that. And then you call and they're not answering. Your calls. That's the way of the world. It's not the, read, read, read the patriarchs. All of them had the fundamental principle of wealth. You're not going to do it more than Abraham or Solomon. You're not the first. There are principles that govern wealth. I'll teach it. That one demand who? Peggy, Pastor, Pastor Zach's wife. She has volunteered. It's going to be, but it won't be like a Sunday, Sunday. I need like some time where we can really sit and discuss this. But let me finish. The, 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 the world can and will be successful in their way. You see, Psalms 37 verses 7. He says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way. There are people who prosper in the way of the world and the world comes for it. It always takes it. It can take 10 years, 15 years, but they, that, that does not leave an inheritance because it doesn't carry the blessing. Somebody can sell an organ and, of a child and make wealth. A woman can sell her body and make wealth. Anybody can make, become wealthy or prosperous or advance in any way. There are kids who are giving their bodies to lecturers to advance in their... Max, do you understand? That's them. You go the God way. Go the God way. You go the God way. And God says it exists. So, prosperity is of God. It is of God. It is of God. And as long as you seek the Lord, 
or as long as the Lord is with you, the Bible says the path of the just shines brighter and brighter and brighter and to a perfect day. The message version says the longer they live, the brighter they shine. So I pray over you in the name of Jesus. In the simplicity of the word that has been spoken tonight, that may God propel you, your family, your household, your ministry, your dreams, your innovations, your inventions, your creations, your brand, your representation in the world that is seen or unseen. May God fulfill that prosperity, advancement, progress that he has promised upon your life and align you to your purpose by frustrating every obstacle that would stand in your way to fulfill the dream that he has toward you. And that the end of this shall not be in the, 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 the amount of things that you have amassed in life, but in the lives that you have changed and in the fulfillment of the needs of the kingdom of God, wherever he will place you. I decree and I declare that you're prosperous in everything you will do this year. Next year, you are going to live more prosperously than you did last year in wealth, in health, in peace, in wisdom, in career, in ministry, in marriage, in every aspect of your life. It can only be so and not otherwise. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're sick in this house, receive your healing now. That's how I heal the sick. And if you want, you take it. If you don't want, you need. Receive your healing now. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as I finish our service, I always warned you that second service is usually longer. You know why? Because I enjoy it. So if I push, I should have ended 30 minutes ago, but I usually want to, especially because second, second service usually has people who have come a few years later, three years and below usually second service. First service people are usually the older folk who I don't need much time with. But with you, I usually want to give you more times uh, so I can pump in more. I hope that's okay. Yeah, so as uh, we close our service, if there's anybody here and you say, today I want to receive Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. I want to be born again today. Come now and I pray with you now. Come. Today you say, I want Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. Because in all of this, he shed his blood for you. He died for you that you might live. If you're there and you say, I want to receive Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. Come here right now. I want to pray with you. Stand up. Beautiful. 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 Jesus, you're beautiful to me. Wonderful. Come. Wonderful. Wonderful. Oh. Glorious. Glorious. Gloria, Jesus, wonderful, 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 wonderful. young lady in uh, yellow and uh, many colors. What's your name? Sheba, the Lord tells me to pray from your spinal cord up to here, to the back. I'm talking to you. I'm going to pray for you, okay? I want to pray. I see an attack the devil is bringing on your, your spinal cord and I'm going to pray today. It will not happen, okay? Stay there as you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So, those of you who have come, repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you because you died for my sins and you were raised for my glory. Tonight, 
I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. I'm born again. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, bless these people work in their lives more than ever before. Go ahead before them. May the world see the transformation of your word in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. This broadcast was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information about the great work of God, visit us on the web at www.fenero.org or download the Fenero app today and enjoy sermons, daily devotionals, and timely updates. The Fenero app, available on both Google Play and Apple App Store. You may also email us at info at Fenero.org. Follow us on social media platforms on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Fenero, make manners.